That is the question. Everyone, great, good, bad or indifferent, wants to play Hamlet. There is just something eternal about it, and there's something eternal about Hamlet himself, um, that people keep coming back to it. People are fascinated by it. It's tormented, uh, full of contradiction. Unfortunately, it is also the most intelligent play ever. I, I totally agree. I think it is the Holy Grail. To be or not to be, that is the question. Full of revenge and violence. I think we enjoy living out the fantasy of revenge. Um, I, I think we've all had moments in life when we've wished to exact some. So uh, watching somebody else do it, I think, is, is rather sweet. To be or not to be, that is the question. actors as a group who want to play Hamlet want it to be our own. We are so jealous and obsessive about that role because we think, not that it's every man in any sense, but that part of our personality, it invites all our personalities to be raw and naked and therefore we possess it. And we, there's a huge competition in Hamlet, I think, going on, you know? We don't want to admire anybody else. We want to admire ourselves as Hamlet. <laughs> Hamlet, think of us as of a father, for let the world take note. You are the most immediate to our throne and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart toward you. I've been in this play about five times, I think, and each time it's been an extraordinarily different experience. Um, in a sense, the play is defined, obviously, by the man who's playing Hamlet. Who is Hamlet? Um, well, whoever's playing it at the time, uh, I suppose. Um, I, that's quite a flip answer, but I think it's probably also true. I think Hamlet is... It, I, Hamlet only exists in performance. It, it, you know, it's a play. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all the visage wand? Tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing. I think Hamlet discloses many different uh, levels which uh, reveal themselves in in the many subsequent performances that have been made of it. He goes through everything. He goes through the whole... I mean, he says himself, very proud, ambitious, revengeful, um, remorseful. Uh, he's, he's a wonderful character to play. He can be furious and aggressive. He can be introspective and, uh, uh, and weak. He can be uh, thundering. He can be uh, evasive. He has to be gentle, uh, wit, witty, uh, sensitive beyond belief to others, and then he has that dark side in him which must frighten the audience, actually. I mean, now tis the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to the world. There's something diabolical within him. And unless the actor has all those qualities and is able to call on them, then he's not a complete Hamlet. Oh, 
world of this too, too solid flesh would melt. I've seen the Russian versions, the Olivier versions, but the best Shakespeare ever for me is when you see the actor on the stage speaking the lines with perfect clarity. Um, I don't really need anything else than that. For me, it, it, Hamlet is the people I saw play it. I, you know, it's Mark Rylance or it's Derek Jacobi or it's um, Sam West or uh, all the people I saw do it so brilliantly. And, and you can see so many productions of it and it's always new and it's always fresh. And, and it is, to an extent, it's actor proof as well because every actor, there's so much in it that every actor can find something special and fresh and you can play it violently different ways. It is sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. It's a huge part of any dramatic enterprise and a, a theatre particularly, which is why casting is often so important. Um, because uh, the personality of the playwright is, becomes refracted through the personality of an actor. The very intelligent, creative people, they have a hint of uh, cruelty, negativeness, you know. And that is um, self-indulgence. Hamlet is a terrible van vanity fair man. He's, uh, he's always talking about his soul, his uh, duty and his uh, feelings. Uh, he's, he's a bore, actually. To have a friend like that would be awful. But he's irresistible because he's the most intelligent man ever portrayed. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Thaw and resolve itself into a dew. Oh, that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God. God. I think of Hamlet as um, one of my oldest friends in the sense that um, when I was 18, I formed a youth theatre company in my hometown and um, deciding to do a, a, a quite modest production uh, to begin with, uh, I chose Hamlet. <laughs> and it lasted for four hours. Um, it c created a, an enormous stir and I was immensely obsessed about the play and the character. Um, it was one of the first uh, plays that I ever directed, and it was really an amateur production. Uh, it was by invitation uh, from a group of undergraduates at Oxford and Cambridge from the thing called the Oxford and Cambridge Shakespeare Company. I, I think I was impressed by the idea of doing a famous play, but uh, I don't think I was uh, at that time overwhelmed by the importance of the, of the play. I discovered its importance by doing it rather than, as it were, acknowledging its, its reputation. I think I, for most of my career, have avoided Hamlet. I suspect it's because it has such a huge and formidable reputation. Um, and it wasn't really until I I read it again and began to think, what was it that made this play so powerful? What, what gave it its reputation as the, as the great work? And I think I realized that there is no definitive Hamlet. Um, there's no f definitive performance of Hamlet. There are good performances and bad performances, great performances, um, but no definitive performance because there's no definitive text of Hamlet. Even she, oh God, a beast, that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer. Married with my uncle. My father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules within a month. I suppose that you're affected as a director by who is playing the part, who is pretending to be this fictional character. The, the person who is playing this, that, or the other part brings to it 
peculiarities of him or herself. And uh, you often exploit that. I think a director does three things before he goes into rehearsal. He, he usually in, it works with the designer to design the play. He cuts the play and he casts the play. And for me, as Tyron Guthrie once said, good directing is 80% good casting. So I, once I have that actor, I trust that actor. Horatio, I do forget myself. Say, my lord, and your poor servant, Emma. Sir, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. Marcellus. My good lord. I'm very glad to see you. Good evening, sir. Uh -huh. But what is your affair in Elsinore? We'll teach you to drink deep ere you depart. My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I pray you do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift. Thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. People have devoted their entire lives to the study of this field and to the study of Shakespeare's life and to the study of this play. And yet there is so much that we still don't really know. Uh, what we have is an immense stock of fabulously well-informed speculation. The plays are written at a period which is poised on the edge of the beginnings of what we now recognise as democracy. I think Shakespeare was deeply affected by the structure of his society, in which, in fact, a famous long-standing monarch had exercised control and was shortly to disappear. By whom was she to be replaced? Um, was it necessary to replace her by what was previously a monarch, or was there to be an alternative arrangement of society? Well, within 40 years, there was an alternative arrangement of society realised by the turbulence of the, of the Civil War. There was, towards the end of Elizabeth's reign, a, a real sense of nervousness um, as to what was going to uh, happen, uh, who her successor was going to be. It's true that there was a restoration of monarchy uh, by 1660, but it was going to be restored in a very different way to the way in which it had been exercised at the time that Shakespeare was writing. But Shakespeare was sensitive to the social structure of his period and to the as yet not fully expressed doubts about the legitimacy of monarchy. Uh, there was the uh, huge problem of, of um, the, 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 the war between Protestant and, and, and Catholic, of course, at the time. Um, and I, I think um, the, the, the thing from that period that made us, that in a way we responded most to, was the sense of this, the hyper-surveillance, if you like, uh, of the sort of police state that, that they were living in. Was Comes again. Playing Hamlet on film is uh, mighty easier. A lot of problems are solved, particularly in the soliloquies, because you can come in and all we need to do is to whisper, My father's spirit in arms. All is not well. I doubt some foul play. So cinematically, it's the perfect play uh, in that respect. We all, if we're doing it on stage, we have to give the same effect, but projecting enough that those whispers can reach the back row, and that's a big, huge challenge. Uh, so it's a, it's a cinematic piece, very much so. But each one is individual, and each one is specific to the time it's done in uh, as much as to the person who's doing it and to the people you're doing it with. It's, a, it's, also, it's also a play, so it's, it's a collective. It's not a one-man show. What news? None, my lord, but that the world's grown honest. So there is doomsday near. But your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sent you to prison hither? Prison, my lord? Denmark's a prison. Then it's the world one. A goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. <laughs> we wards. think not so, my lord. Why, then, tis none to you. Well, there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. One of the great things that you can do in the cinema is that you can 
it seems banal to say it, show people who are not talking. So characters who have a subplot, which are, which are hard to, if you like, to sustain in the, in the theatre, because they're not talking, therefore the audience is not on them. Um, in the cinema, you can give a great strength. of his plays is so strong and yet one of the reasons why it's so open to many different interpretations is that he gives you the nub of the structure and then he gives you a series of actions which may or may not fit into that structure. Now the job of, of, of a film director or a director is to try and find a lucid path through it all um, and one of the ways of doing that is to be able to film people who are not talking, to give them, to, just to underline them a little bit. I think the revenge story is, is, is the kind of plot that goes through, uh, that drives him, but, uh, but it isn't the play. The play is about a hundred things. It's about, some, it's about someone who is strangely and, and potentially ahead of his time, who, who sees humanity from an extraordinary v viewpoint, particularly at, at, at his tender age. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, shall speak with most miraculous organ. I think the revenge against the father's murder is the skeleton upon which all hangs. It's what makes it a really great play in that... Um, Shakespeare got, gets his plot almost right. Shakespeare's writing um, a great revenge play uh, in the manner of many Jacobean plays. Um, it, was a, it was a great um, genre, if you like, uh, and that does make it uh, thrilling. Um, I think it wouldn't be necessarily a great play if he didn't invest it with, with the sort of moral debate that goes on throughout it. The, guy, the character has a want, he has a desire, um, which, is, which he, he fulfills rather badly. The, the, the obstacle to that desire, which is what really makes it a great play, um, is, his own, is, his, is his himself. There had been uh, previously a play of Hamlet. It was a very well-known story, uh, which is often the case with Shakespeare. He takes a well-known story and writes his version of it. Uh, uh, the previous 20 years, they'd been, the audience had really enjoyed straight up and down revenge dramas uh, like uh, Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy, you know, very popular. I mean, actually, all the Elizabethan theatre of the story of revenges, even Romeo and Juliet, and Juliet everything, there is, all of us, you do something wrong, I kill you. And I think this, uh, with Hamlet, his leading character keeps interrupting this revenge drama uh, and almost stopping the play, going, sorry, everybody, sorry, sorry, we've got to stop now because this is actually very interesting. Uh, I can't actually go and kill him because it's all a problem. Uh, and I'm a f philosophy student, and so I think we'd better uh, all talk about this for a minute. It is very strange. As I do live, my honoured lord, tis true. Indeed, indeed, sirs, but this troubles me. It is perhaps the greatest play he ever wrote. I don't think King Lear is. King Lear is a modern very modern play, and that's what is so extraordinary about it. But it isn't a great poetic play, strangely enough. It's the prose that is so extraordinary in King Lear and how modern it sounds. Hamlet has both. He has great poetry at its simplest and great prose at its simplest. It's not only is Shakespeare reflecting through the language on things, but Hamlet is reflecting upon himself. And there's a de the depth to it. It's not Lear, which essentially is a fairy story um, with psychology sort of attached to it. And the limitations of that always emerge. The, the, the difficulty with a lot of Shakespeare's plays is the fairy story element. My father's spirit in arms. All is not well. I doubt some foul play. Would the night were come? Till then sit still, my soul. 
foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. I myself think that the play exists as a, a verse play. It has to do with the words, and knowing how to say the words in the verse form is essentially uh, absolutely important in the delivery of the play. The words are hugely important, and the verse is hugely important. It is um, how to act, really. Um, Shakespeare saying this is how you should do it. I mean, it's wonderful. It's, it's got everything in it. There's nothing that compares in any of the soliloquies to the to the speech about uh, what a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite, infinite in fact. In form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, a paragon of animals. That's Hamlet to me, that's the key. The philosopher prince. I don't think either the poetry or anything else is what makes it compelling. What makes it compelling is the fact that it's a deeply interesting story about uh, uh, the rage of a young man about the uh, usurping tyranny of his uncle. Not because he feels that he is cut off from the role for which he is the, the justified inheritor, but because he feels something monstrous has occurred um, and the monstrosity dis uh, discloses itself as a result of meeting the ghost who tells him what he probably has already suspected. I am thy father's spirit. Doomed for a certain term to walk the night. And for the day confined to fast thin fires. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house. I could a tale unfold. Is this ghost a figment of his own imagination, as he suggests to himself occasionally? Is, is it just, an, you know, his own conscience breaking? What is it? He wants it to be true. He believes it's entirely credible. For him, it makes sense of everything that's happened. If thou didst ever thy dear father love, revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? It, 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 it allows him to believe that Claudius is the bad guy. It, there's a villain of the piece, suddenly. <laughs> No sooner is he given the job of revenging his father's death than he, as it were, says how sad he is that he has to do it. He walks away from it in many kinds of ways. And I think that's part of, again, at the start of the play, part of what he's finding so difficult is that there's nothing he can do. But it is, I think, uh, there that the problem uh, begins with Hamlet. Why doesn't he act? What is it that causes this lassitude? What is it that prevents him from obeying the ghost's instruction, his father's instruction, to go and kill Claudius. What is it? He doesn't know, and it doesn't become clear ever, ever, ever in the course of the play. He doesn't have in his makeup any of the sort of impulsive decisions and military knowledge and quick action uh, stuff in his sort of chemistry that will make it capable, him capable of making a decision as to how to, to revenge his father's death. The desire for revenge is there. And yet, we all understand, we all understand that if you think about it in reality, the capacity to do something as vicious and bloody as he as has to do is not easy. <laughs> Look 
убавляют пламя. He's trying to live out his fantasies, and he can't quite do it, which is, I imagine, where a lot of us would find ourselves. Uh, however justified we felt, the actual act of sticking a knife into somebody's back uh, is ultimately, I suspect, fairly inconceivable to most of us, um, as indeed it is to Hamlet. Uh, uh, so I think his, his dilemma is, is very instantly recognisable to us all. Now might I do it, Pat? No, he's a praying. And now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven, and so am I revenged. That would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that I his sole son do this same villain send to heaven. When he is fit and seasoned for his passage. Why, this is hire and salary, not revenge. The play itself is about something other than it seems to be. There's an allegorical structure underlying Hamlet, which is of huge importance to its understanding, though it doesn't actually help in the playing of it. And the allegory has to do with the suffering of the Catholic community during the time of the Reformation, through the um, Henrician period, uh, Edward VI, and through, um, more especially for this play, the Elizabethan period. Uh, with William Cecil in the driving seat, so to speak. What was the Catholic community to do in the face of the Reformation? Was it to get up and act, to throw off the yoke of this state-sponsored religion, to attack those people who were attacking them, to re-establish the papal authority and so on? What was to be done? And that uh, position, is, as it were, pictured forth in the play by the ghost. The ghost is the symbol of the old Catholic order. And Hamlet is called by the ghost to restore that order, to kill Claudius, who is Henry VIII, he's Cromwell, he's all of those people wrapped up. He is the man who represents the oppression, the disenfranchisement of the Catholic community. He is called on to do that. So, uncle, there you are. <laughs> now to my word, it is adieu, adieu. Remember me. Hamlet is, in fact, as it were, John Nobody, if you like. He is the, the Catholic community writ large, a crypto-Catholic himself. And why doesn't he act? Well, why didn't the Catholics at the time act? And nobody knows the answer to that, since they have cause and will and means to do it. Nevertheless, they didn't act. And Hamlet, in the person of this restorer of the Catholic fortunes, of course, um, he doesn't act. Come hither, gentlemen. Lay your hands again upon my sword. Never to speak of this that you have heard. Swear by my sword. Swear! How dare I have that this is wondrous strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth or issue than are dreamt of in our philosophy. Th there is a problem, of course, because the allegorical... Uh, as it were, the parallel story is so strong and fits so perfectly. There are occasions when the allegory gets in the way of the, the play as it's being seen. So Polonius, who, as portrayed in the play, comes across as a, a rather lovely old fella, very astute politically, someone on whom Claudius uh, relies absolutely and is, is, is stern with his daughter, but not necessarily unloving. And he's very uh, anxious uh, about his, his, his son and willing to exp extend the pastoral care. That he does that by employing spies, of course, in Paris is another point entirely. But he comes across as essentially a lovable, affable man who gets a lot of laughs for the right reasons, it seems to me. Oh, no, a rat? Dead for a ducket! <laughs> Dead! Why are you just so tough? Nay, I know not. Is it the king? <laughs> that he should be killed in this, in this shocking fashion is, is awful. Hamlet is 
unrepentant about it. He says, you know, I'll lug the guts into the neighbor room. As he's most secret, most grave, and most still, and all the rest of those things. and doesn't give a toss for him, you know. And you think, well, that is unkind. And this from the glass of fashion and the mold of form, the man who's supposed to be so sensitive, you know, sensitive to the fall of a sparrow, if you like. And this seems, sits uneasily with Hamlet's uh, character as we know him. The problem is, of course, that, that we know, uh, if you, you study the, the actual history of the, the, the play, that uh, Polonius was based on William Cecil. And Cecil was a much unloved figure, very unloved figure. And behind his um, incipient dementia and his bluff exterior, he was a very, very, very nasty man indeed, who employed spies and torture, the rack and every, all the apparatus uh, to get what he wanted to maintain the Tudor dynasty. And wh when you knew that, you'd be on Hamlet's side if you were sitting in the audience, you know, and particularly if you were a Catholic, you'd be on his side. Yes, get rid of the old sob, that's the way to do it. But as it happens in the play for a modern audience, it feels remarkably unkind. How does your honor for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed long to re-deliver. I pray you now receive them. No, not I. I never gave you aught. My honored lord, you know right well you did. And with them words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich. Ophelia, as she's played, it's, it's a very difficult part to play because again, there the allegorical underpinnings, if you like, of the play get in the way of uh, proper character development. What she stands for is quite different from what she is as a character as writ. One can quite easily understand in terms of the allegory that she represented to Hamlet and for Hamlet a possible compromise between the uh, Reformation, the Reformed English Church, if you like, and uh, Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord. You made me believe so. She represents a conjoining of the honesty of Geneva with the beauty of Rome. The best bits of both religion. Put them together, call them Ophelia. And she's presented to Hamlet for his delectation. And he has a brief love affair with her. We will have... No more marriages. <laughs> Those that are married already. <laughs> All but one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. I imagine they were certainly very close once. I, I imagine they've drifted. But I think when the world comes crashing in around him, he reaches out, he wants to reach out to her, um, certainly for comfort, but he can't go there because he can't trust her, he can't be sure that he can trust her, uh, although he desperately wants to, which is why his betrayal by her is felt so bitterly by him. And he finally rejects her and says, get thee to a nunnery. And he rejects that way out for the Roman Catholics. He's saying that compromise and accommodation with the Reformed, uh, the Reformation Church, Church of England, in other words, that kind of accommodation is not possible. It won't wash. <sighs> to be or not to be, that is the question whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. To die, to sleep no more, and by that sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, 
to sleep? To sleep, perchance to dream? Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. The great central speech, uh, to be or not to be, though it reads quite all right as a kind of existential analysis of the human condition, if you like, after Albert Camus or any of the existentialists come to think of it, also reads very well as a call to action or not. Uh, a call to action to the Catholics, to be or not to be, to be, as it were, in the situation of an oppressed Catholic majority in England. To be that or not to be that, to rise up and fight against the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the law's delay, all of that. That is what the summons is in the play, and that's what's discussed in the speech. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of trouble, and by opposing and them. He doesn't come to any conclusions in that, but that certainly is what the speech would seem to be about in its historical context. Of course, the difficulty is that for a modern audience, you can't play that because that allegorical significance is lost. It's just beyond our view, so to speak. And certainly the audiences that come to see it, uh, the actors who are playing it even, don't know the history and certainly don't feel the weight of the history, though they might know it of it in an abstract sense. That is the problem there. To be or not to be, that is the question. Here's a man, Hamlet, in the world which he finds disgusting, which he finds nauseating, which he finds alien to him. It's rank, full of weeds. They possess it utterly. Uh, it's a terrible, terrifying place. And the question is whether it's worth going on in this world. That, that is an extraordinary maturity of mind, but not an extraordinary maturity if we imagine that um, Hamlet is a philosophy student, um, uh, f f philosophy and possibly even divinity student. I mean, the most interesting things that Hamlet has to say are questions about what it's like to be alive. And I think Shakespeare is all the time giving Hamlet the most intelligent analysis. He was a crypto-Catholic. Uh, the people he ran with, Southampton, uh, Essex and so on, they were Catholics. And I think he was writing in his behalf. And the assumption, I think, is that Hamlet was worked up as a play, from an older Ur uh, Hamlet play, was worked up as a call to arms to the Catholic community as a way of discussing the situation they were in and what was to be done about it and what were the ramifications of that situation for the Catholic community. The discussion is one which any Catholic would have with himself about his role in the society of the time. Everything points to it as far as I can see in the play. Not one now to mock your own grinning. Quite chop fallen. Now get you to my lady's chamber. Tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. Shakespeare knew, embarking on writing Hamlet, that he wanted to write a play about death. But just as in Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare writes a play about love, but at the same time he writes a play about hate. And in Othello, he writes a play about jealousy, but at the same time he writes a play about trust. Then 
in Hamlet, he writes a play exploring every kind of response to death, idea of death, image of death, recognition of death. One of the great things about him is that you can say, you can put it in, in its context, in its proper context, in the Elizabethan world, if you like, and then you can realise how intensely the same human psychology has been over 500 years, how it hasn't changed a jot. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis? This is I, Hamlet the Dane. All the values that he um, ascribed to uh, in the past have been destroyed for him. His mother, maternal love, the purity of that has been destroyed the love of his mother for his father, that has been destroyed. The whole, the pillars of his world have been broken and cracked and the whole world has come tumbling around down his ears. He starts uh, with the funeral, eh? And then it tells us he's absolutely restless. He has an idea of revenge, 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 revenge. Look to the queen there! How does my lord? How does the queen? She swoons to see them bleed. The fascinating thing about the play is that it's a global phenomenon. Everybody recognises Hamlet. And unlike with Romeo and Juliet, it actually happens to be quite close to the truth. Um, and so it's fascinating the way that ha actually has caught on. The king. The king's to blame. The point and venom too. Then venom to thy <laughs> It's a play that I think I know inside out, and um, it's a character that I've thought about many times and from many different points of view. It is a play that you can keep going back to and should be rediscovered each time because it changes and it moves. Horatio, I am dead. The potent poison quite o'ercrows my spirit. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, I have sent thee from felicity a while. Is Hamlet every man? I don't think he is, because, good God, how can every man be as scholastic, be as witty? be as wise, be as all those, all those things that that creature is at the age of 26 or whatever the hell he was supposed to be. Uh, that's not every man. But there is Hamlet in every man. There's, ha there's a bit of Hamlet in all of us, but the whole of Hamlet, impossible. And that's why it remains un totally unchallenged as a part. The rest. Is silent.